Hello guys, uh, this chapter, uh, chapter 16 is about how DNA uh, multiplies and one strand of DNA becomes two strands. So uh, you remember we talked about this, uh, this, this is a DNA. So I do not have, maybe I can break uh, my son's toy. Uh, so this is going to become two strands and that happens during the S phase of interface. You remember that from previous chapters. And that's what the, pretty much the nuts and bolts of this chapter uh, is about. So let's, let's go ahead and talk about it. Here's structure of DNA. Uh, they're showing you to be specially. Uh, this is the legs of the ladder right here. You guys can see that. And these are the steps of the ladder. So imagine this ladder twisted, and that would be the structure of DNA, which you're uh, seeing it right now. So Watson and Creek, they won the Nobel Prize for figuring out the structure of DNA. And here they are um, back in the 1950s in the laboratory. They have the uh, stick and uh, what do you call it? Stick and uh, a ball, ball and stick models. Uh, they put the DNA together. A little bit of uh, background, a little bit of history behind what happened with uh, DNA. I don't want to make this chapter longer than what it is, but please read it on your own. Make sure you understand it. And uh, if you have any question, let me know. So what happened at the beginning, they didn't know the basis of inheritance is protein, RNA, or DNA. And they didn't know which one of these three are responsible for um, transferring information, genetic information from one generation to the next generation. So what happened, the Griffith had performed an experiment right here. So he took some uh, bacteria that they would kill mouse right here. So it would kill mouse. And then what happened, he took the uh, non-pathogenic uh, bacteria in here and they, he injected to the mouse, they didn't die. And then he took the uh, heat killed S phase, the S cells of the bacteria. And then after he heated a little bit, the bacteria, the bacteria became non-pathogenic. Then what he did, he combined these two together, this one and that one, okay? This one does not kill the bacteria, uh, the, the mouse, and this one, does, this bacteria does not kill the mouse. He combined them together, he put them in a solution, and then he put them into the mouse, and then well, the mouse died. So what he concluded that there are some uh, uh, material, which is called DNA, the materials, they combine together and they can become pathogenic bacteria. So, and that's called transformation right here, yeah, transformation right here. So mixture of heat kill and S uh, cells and the living R cells. So what happened, the living cells, they took the DNA from here, incorporated into themselves transformation and they became pathogenic. That's pretty much based on this experiment. So evidence of uh, viral DNA can program cells. Yes, more evidence based on um, DNA on uh, viruses, which was performed. Here is a um, phage or phage, they call it. And you saw it in the chapter or oh, 19, I believe, or 18. And you saw that I'm talking about viruses. Here they are. Oh, okay, let's watch this video. Bacteriophages, or phages, are viruses that infect bacteria. This is a T2 phage, which consists of DNA inside a protein code. The reproductive cycle of the T2 phage begins when the tail fibers of the phage stick to the receptor sites on the surface of a host bacterium, such as E. coli. The phage injects its DNA into the host cell, leaving the empty protein code outside. The DNA of the host cell is destroyed and host cell enzymes and nucleotides are commandeered to replicate the phage DNA, 
making morphage DNA. The host cell's enzymes and ribosomes are used to manufacture phage proteins. Phage parts accumulate and assemble to form phages. A phage enzyme digests the bacterial cell wall and the cell ruptures, or lysis. As many as 200 phages spill out, each of them may go on to infect another cell. This diagram summarizes the reproductive cycle of bacteriophage T2. Okay. Here are uh, Hershey Chase experiment. They, uh, uh, they figure out with the help of viruses that uh, it's actually DNA that is responsible for the inheritance. So pretty much I said it. Okay, let's go with uh, the structure of DNA. What do you need to know? This, this is the ladder. And in this diagram, you're seeing half of this ladder. So you're seeing the leg of this ladder and half of the steps. So the leg of the ladder, if you would, it is phosphate here. I don't know if you guys can see, guys can see. Phosphate here, sugar here, phosphate here, sugar here. Attached to the sugar molecules right here, these are sugar molecules. Attached to the sugar molecules are nitrogenous spaces, which we talk about right here. Nitrogenous space, nitrogenous space, nitrogenous space. So it is double stranded. It's uh, helix, twisted. That's what helix means. So the other strand, the other side, which I will talk about it in a minute. Again, it is phosphate here, sugar here, phosphate here, sugar here, phosphate here, sugar here. So, and that's what you have. Phosphate, sugar, the sugar molecules, the oxyribose. Look at that. Uh, Carbon number two, the hydrogen attached to it does not have oxygen. In case of RNA, that right here, carbon number two has oxygen. That's what they call it, ribonucleic acid. This is called deoxyribonucleic acid, nucleic acid. Okay, so phosphate, sugar, phosphate, and attached to the sugar molecules are your nitrogenous bases right here. The nitrogenous bases you learn at the beginning of semester, they are either one ring or two rings. One ring or two rings. The two rings are, uh, in this case, adenine and guanine, which they are purines and pyrimidines. They are one ring. Okay, they have one ring. And we talked about that at the beginning of semester. And then if you will look at it, the phosphate, if this is the end of the DNA, this is the end of DNA, right? So this is the five prime end. It means the phosphate is attached to the sugar carbon number five. And then the other end, the sugar, the, uh, uh, the phosphate, is attached to sugar number prime, three prime. The other end is three prime, and that end is five prime. I hope I'm making some sense. I didn't confuse you guys. The sugar itself, I'm not talking about uh, anything else. The sugar itself on this end is by itself alone. The sugar itself right here is not attached to phosphate anymore. Okay, but the sugar on that side end as attached to phosphate is five prime end. And then the sugar in this end is three prime end. You remember in the past, I talked about amino acids. This end of amino acid is C terminus and this end of the amino acid is N terminus. You remember that? Same thing as DNA, we have ends. This end is five prime end, and that end is three prime end. But then, yeah, let's move on. Oh, okay, another video. Let's watch it. DNA and RNA are nucleic acids, polymers made of subunits called nucleotides. One difference between DNA and RNA is the type of sugar their nucleotides contain. DNA contains the sugar deoxyribose while RNA contains the sugar ribose. 
Ribose has one more oxygen atom than deoxyribose. DNA and RNA are each composed of four different nucleotides, which differ in their nitrogenous bases. Three of the four bases are the same in DNA and RNA, adenine, guanine, and cytosine. The fourth base in DNA is thymine. In RNA, it is uracil. The nitrogenous bases guanine and adenine each have two linked rings of atoms. They are called purines. Cytosine, thymine, and uracil each have a single ring, and these three bases are called pyrimidines. For convenience, the carbon atoms in a nucleotide sugars are numbered, beginning with the carbon atom bonded to the nitrogenous base, moving around the ring, and up to the carbon that is bonded to the phosphate group. The one prime carbon is bonded to the nitrogenous base, the three prime carbon to the next nucleotide, and the five prime carbon to the phosphate group. DNA and RNA are polynucleotides, long chains of nucleotides. Polynucleotides are always assembled in the five prime to three prime direction. A covalent bond forms between the carbon at the three prime position of a nucleotide and the phosphate group at the five prime position of the next nucleotide. Okay. RNA usually consists of a single polynucleotide chain. DNA, on the other hand, consists of two polynucleotide chains. The two DNA chains, or strands, are oriented in opposite directions and held together by hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases on opposite strands. Because of their sizes, shapes, and arrangement of polar groups, the DNA bases form complementary pairs. Adenine pairs with thymine, and cytosine pairs with guanine. The two polynucleotides in DNA wind around each other to form the familiar double helix. The bases can be in any order, like the letters of the alphabet. However, the base sequence is significant. Sequences of bases called genes encode the instructions for the structure and function of an organism. Okay. So you saw that one very well. Um, the first person who uh, threw the X-ray uh, diffraction photograph X-ray, which is this one, was Rosalind Franklin in England, in Cambridge. He figured out, uh, you know, the DNA, but he couldn't. Uh, she couldn't interpret. So when Watson and Creek got that diagram, they figured it out together. And that's how they won the Nobel Prize. Some people say that uh, Rosalind actually knew she should have won the Nobel Prize, not Watson and Creek, but that's for history books and not for this class. So uh, Franklin's, as I talked about it, uh, she had the um, uh, crystallographic uh, image of DNA and uh, Watson and Creek were able to identify it. Here it is. So the anti-parallel model that you should know as the video showed it, so one strand goes this way, the other strand is opposite way. That's what they call it, anti-parallel. So this, this is parallel, right? They're parallel, but one strand goes this way and the other strand goes that way. So that's what uh, the structure of DNA is. And how that is, so imagine the sugar molecule is at five prime end. You can see that five prime end because this is carbon number five. Okay, and this is carbon number one is attached to uh, the nitrogenous space right here. So this is carbon number two. This is carbon number three attached to the phosphate group. And then, so what do you have? Yeah, this way, this is the way that the strands of DNA is running. The other side, if you would, the five prime end would be here and the sugar molecule, if you would, is upside down. And then phosphate here, sugar here, phosphate here, sugar here. And at the very end, your this carbon right here, okay, that would be your three prime end. So this end is five prime end right here that carbon is five prime N and that end is three prime N. This end is five prime N, we talked about it, and that is 
three prime n of a one million peaks of sense. So that's what they call it. That's why the DNA structure is anti-parallel. And based on law of base pairing, law of, I should mention it here, of base pairing, what happens during law of base pairing always, this is always, A have a double hydrogen bond to T and adenine, of course, when I say A, you know what I'm talking about, adenine, thymine, and then guanine binds to C, to cytosine, and they form, they have three hydrogen bonds. This is a purine, this is pyrimidine, a pyr uh, purine and pyrimidine, purine, pyrimidine, okay? And that's what it is. Two hydrogen bonds, three hydrogen bonds, another animation. DNA consists of two complementary strands of nucleotides twisted together to form a double helix. In the space filling model, each atom is represented by a small sphere. The yellow and red phosphate groups make the two sugar phosphate backbones easy to spot. They're on the outside of the double helix. We will highlight the backbones in blue. Now let's look at the crossbars connecting the backbones. Each crossbar is a hydrogen bonded pair of bases one from each DNA strand. An adenine is always paired with a thymine and a guanine with a cytosine. A double helix can also be represented by a ball and stick model. For simplicity, a ribbon model is often used with ribbons for the sugar phosphate backbones. Okay. So Watson and Creek, he, they figured out that uh, two purines would not be matched because it's too white. Okay, the X-ray did not show that. And then two pyrimidines will be too narrow. Again, the X-ray uh, crystal graph will not be, it did not show that. The only way that the uh, X-ray crystal graph showed it it's one side is a purine and the other side is a pyrimidine. I said the other way around, sorry about that. So this side is a um, purine and that side is a pyrimidine. And of course, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar. Okay, so that would be the only way. One purine and one pyrimidine. And uh, these are your nitrogen spaces. He's showing you that there are two nitrogen, uh, two hydrogen bonds, okay, right here. And then this guy's the guanine and cytosine, they have three hydrogen bonds, okay? So the basic principle base pairing, I already talked about that. Uh, semi uh, when, when the DNA is going to multiply, one strand is going to be from the two strand, they divide through the, uh, again, semi-conservative model, Watson and Creek. They said, what is semi-conservative model, okay? The semi-conservative model, it means, so this is the original DNA. The original DNA. And then when it's multiplying, the two strands come apart. And then the new strand is formed by the old strand, okay? That is called the semi-conservative model. The other models could be, you know, um, right here, conservative model. Uh, well, semi-conservative one is the one that is uh, right now. And then we have this, uh, dispersive models. So I'm not gonna go again over these. Um, you guys, you know, you have the one model and then you have one DNA, the conservative, and then the new one is formed and then you end up with three new one. And they've done this with radioactive. They label the DNA and they follow them. So this is the most accepted one. And then you have two new ones based on the other one. So again, uh, this is the experiment they've done. 
And I don't think I want to ask any question during the exam about the experiments, um, but you should know what is going on. Okay, getting started, uh, replication begins at a particular end. So now let's talk about the S phase of interface. You remember we talked about that. So what is involved? Uh, uh, let's go ahead and talk about those. Replication begins at the particular sites called origin of replications, where the two DNA strands are separated, opening up a replication bubble. So you have these bubbles throughout the DNA, but throughout the DNA you have these bubbles. Okay, and then you will see where these bubbles, you will see a picture of them. And eukaryotic chromosomes may have hundreds, even thousands of uh, origin of replications of these bubbles. Okay, replication proceeds in both uh, directions. It goes both ways. If you have bubbles here, bubbles here, replication is going to go that way and that way. Okay, so both way, and you will see it in a minute. Until the entire nucleotide, uh, until the entire molecule is caught. Right here, you can see the bubbles. Again, there is a lot of pictures. Here is a bacteria. This showing this is showing what's happening in bacteria. Bacteria DNA. It's a, it's a plasmid. It's a circular DNA. Two strands, as you can see, and then they form bubble also, and they go this way and that way. However, our DNA in human is not a circular DNA. It's not a plasmid. This is a plasmid. Where is the word? I'm going to write it down. Plasmid. But this DNA is, the, in our DNA, it's just straight line. You can see it, straight line. Okay. So there are bubbles form. And what happened uh, during these bubbles, they go both directions. They go both directions. And then this is the template, the old one. This is the new one. This is the new one. This is the old one. Okay. That's a semi conservative. Replication of a DNA molecule begins with a specific sequence called an origin of replication. The two strands separate, forming a small replication bubble. DNA replication starts and then proceeds in both directions until the original DNA molecule is completely replicated. Each of the two daughter molecules consists of one old strand, shown in purple, and one new strand, shown in green. The DNA of a eukaryotic chromosome has multiple origins of replication. The multiple replication bubbles allow this very long molecule to be copied quite quickly, resulting in two daughter DNA molecules. Okay. So at the end of each replication, a uh, bubble is a, a replication fork, a Y. Yes, uh, you saw that uh, region where the, the new strands of DNA are elongated. Then we are getting into enzymes now. Uh, what are the nuts and bolts uh, of what molecules are involved to make this replication occur? This is one DNA becomes two DNA. So helicase is an enzyme that untwists. Remember, DNA is twisted in order to become, uh, in order to become uh, duplicated, it has to become untwisted. So the enzyme that goes around and untwists the DNA is called helicase, okay? So, and single-stranded binding proteins uh, bind uh, to the stabilize. And then what happens when the DNA becomes uh, straight, this is twisted, becomes straight, your protein molecules go attach here. So it, it, it does not twist again. And that's what that is, single-stranded uh, binding proteins. And you will see that in the diagram. Uh, topoisomerase, another enzyme corrects over uh, rewinding ahead of the replications for it by breaking, uh, uh, swelling. If DNA, remember, if DNA is it's like this, tangled up, what happens that enzymes goes and make sure DNA becomes straight. Okay, you will see right here, yeah, very good. The isomerase goes ahead, way ahead, and not kind of, uh, not, you know, if it is twisted, DNA, of course it is twisted and makes DNA straight. 
it gets it ready for hel uh, helicase, DNA helicase, which comes an unzip, like a zipper, right? I do not have a zipper in here to show you guys, but it will unzip it, the DNA, right? Remember, this is in this model, if you would, this is adenine, this is thymine, this is guanine, cytosine, uh, thymine, adenine, uh, cytosine, guanine, adenine, thymine, uh, thymine, adenine. You guys, you know what I'm talking about. So what does the helicase goes and break down those hydrogen bonds between them. Three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine and two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine. It breaks it. And then there are other protein molecules right here, single-stranded binding proteins. That's what the name is, single-stranded proteins. They will keep the proteins from joining again. If these proteins were not around, right? And then DNA, a helicase will separate them. What would happen? These two strands will come together. And then of course, we're getting, this diagram is getting ahead of itself, but that's okay. Uh, I wish they would not show you the primase. Primase is another enzyme which has a little bit of RNA, okay, as a primer. And then what happens, it's going through uh, three prime end to five prime end right here. Okay, and you will see this. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. Okay, so. DNA polymerase cannot initiate synthesis of uh, polynucleotides. They only can uh, add nucleotides to the existing three prime and the initial nucleotide strands is the short strands of RNA prime prime. Okay, so I have not gave you that DNA yet, that um, uh, enzyme yet, that enzyme yet. I will hang on. The enzyme primase, remember, are we talked about it, primase right here. So uh, the enzyme primase uh, can start an RNA chain uh, from scratch and add it uh, and adds RNA nucleotides uh, one at a time to using the uh, parental DNA as a template. The primary is short right here. The primer is short. How many strands? Uh, five, 10 nucleotide strands. And, uh, and it starts from three prime. This I'm not worried about, five, 10 is short. But this I'm worried about, three prime, that you should know it starts from three prime and serves as the starting points for the new um, DNA strand. Okay, synthesizing a new DNA strand. So, uh, so far, if you would, I don't see any new RNA in here. Everything is old and just enzymes unzipping and uh, unwinding and you know, uh, forming uh, uh, RNA primer and primase, there's no DNA. So what happens, DNA polymerase, remember I said I have not talked about it yet. Now I'm talking about it. DNA polymerase, it will go ahead and add new Trans new one to the old one. So the enzyme that actually add the new strands, the old one is DNA polymerase. Okay, and then you will see DNA polymerase goes back and check if there are any mistakes or not. Okay, let's go on. Most DNA polymerase requires a primer and a DNA template strands, yes. Uh, the rate of elongation is about 500 nucleotides per second and bacteria is 50. So kind of you get a feeling uh, that, you know, well, you should know in eukaryotic, this attachment of the new strands, the old one is faster than uh, the um, bacterial DNA. Each nucleotide that is added to growing DNA strand is nuclear is a nucleoside triphosphate. Uh, that's what they call it. Uh, and you will see that in a diagram. Uh, DATP, you remember the ATP, we studied it before, it was a ribose. So, but this ATP is D 
deoxyribose ATP. So binds adenine, okay, uh, to the DNA uh, is similar to the ATP of energy metabolism. Remember that we talked about it, but this one is a little bit different. The difference is the here we go. The DATP uh, has the oxyribose while ATP, we studied it that I'm unable to do this with my arms right now. I'm breaking down ATP to ADP. Previous chapters, it was the ribose. That's the difference. But anyhow, as each uh, monomer, the ATP joins the DNA strands, it loses uh, two phosphates uh, group as a molecule of pyrophosphate. So right here, you're talking about uh, DATP, you know, it loses two phosphates before you, you talk about it, ATP becomes ADP, you break down one phosphate, here you're breaking down two phosphates. So that's, I am showing you what is happening here. That's not only with uh, DATP, with uh, GT, uh, GTP, CTP, they all loses two phosphate. Okay, the anti-parallel structures of the double helix affects uh, replications, and then uh, the DNA polymerase added nucleotides only to the three prime three end. Okay, of the growing strand. So therefore, a new strand can elongate only in the five prime to three prime direction. Can you see that? Let's see. Oh. Okay, these are the list of the enzymes. Um, I'm not gonna go over them, I already talked about them, uh, but just a couple of things that um, DNA ligase, we'll talk about them later on, but you do have PowerPoints that talks about these. But remember, you have two RNA polymerase that you should know, RNA polymerase one and RNA polymerase three, they add new DNA to three prime end and replaces RNA one uh, DNA polymerase one replaces the RNA with DNA. Remember, you had the primer in there, that has to be replaced. And what is the enzyme evolved? DNA polymerase one. Okay. And then DNA polymerase three, which you already talked about it, he added the new ones to the uh, old DNA. Okay, so uh, here they are. A few things, these little things, we already talked about all of these. You already seen these protein molecules, you already seen the helicase, and so on and so forth. Here is a primer, you've seen it. But you have not seen, there are little segments, they call them lagging strands. And of course, the orange at the end is the, the primer, okay, the RNA primer. And then the blue one in this diagram, light blue, is the DNA, new strands of DNA. And then you have one which is called the leading strand. This is the leading strand. This is the leading strand. And these are called lagging strand. At the end of each one of them, the leading and lagging there is a primer right here, RNA primer, okay? And then, as I said in the last one, the RNA uh, DNA polymerase one will go and replace this one and add DNA. Let's watch this one. See what it's so now look at the process of DNA replication more closely, starting at an origin of replication. The DNA opens up there to form a small bubble. Molecules of an enzyme called helicase attach to the DNA at the ends of the bubble and continue the unwinding of the double helix. We'll focus on one end of the bubble on the Y-shaped region called a replication fork. The two strands would naturally tend to rewind, but are held apart by molecules of a single strand binding protein. The synthesis of a new strand begins when an enzyme called primase attaches and synthesizes a short RNA strand that is complementary to one of the DNA strands. This piece of RNA is a primer. DNA polymerase then adds DNA nucleotides to the three prime end of the primer. It continues to lengthen the new DNA strand by adding nucleotides complementary to the template strand. Notice that DNA synthesis always proceeds in a five prime to three prime direction. 
The strand just made here is called the leading strand. The clarity will keep the new double-stranded DNA untwisted. Okay. What are you doing? Okay. Then what happens um, along one template strands of DNA, the DNA polymerase synthesizes the leading strand, which we saw it at continuously moving toward the replication form. Uh, to, uh, to elongate the other new strands called the lagging strands, what the CAD says, DNA polymerase must work in a direction away from replication form. Yeah, that's right, away from, that's the key word, away from replication form. So the lagging strands are called Okazaki, Japanese scientists who found them synthesize a series of segments called Kazakhstan, which are joined together by DNA ligands. That's right. So these are your Okazaki right here, and DNA ligase comes at the end and put them together. Here is a diagram that we already talked about it. Um, it's DNA Paul, it's DNA polymerase 3. Okay. Uh, makes Okazaki fragments, uh, fragment one, and so on and so forth. And then uh, DNA polymerase one, remember that I talked about it, it replaces the RNA primer and add it at uh, DNA uh, two. So pretty much what we talked about it, yeah, here is summarized, please look at it and uh, try to understand it. And here they are showing you one by one, what is happening now. And I think a lagging strands, let's see what it has to say. The other new strand is called the lagging strand. The Unlike the leading strand, strand, the lagging strand cannot be made continuously because DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides at the three prime ends. Instead, the lagging strand must be made of fragments that are linked together. Despite their names, the leading and lagging strands are actually made at the same time. For clarity, here we will just show the lagging strand being pieced together. We'll start with a brief overview of fragments being formed and linked. First, an RNA primer, shown here in red, forms the beginning of each fragment. The rest of each fragment is then synthesized from DNA nucleotides in a five prime to three prime direction. The resulting segments are called Okazaki fragments. Next, each RNA primer is replaced with DNA. Then the gaps are closed to form the lagging strand. Polymerase one. DNA polymerase one. Now let's look closely at how enzymes work together to assemble the lagging strand. <clears throat> First, the enzyme primase removes the single strand binding protein, shown here in blue, and makes an RNA primer to begin an Okazaki fragment. The enzyme DNA polymerase then adds the complementary DNA nucleotides to synthesize the rest of the fragment. The assembly process continues as primase makes new RNA primer and DNA polymerase adds DNA nucleotides to create more Okazaki fragments. After the fragments are made, another kind of DNA polymerase replaces each RNA primer with DNA. Next, the enzyme DNA ligase links the Okazaki fragments to form the lagging strand. Okay. Yeah, the ligase, well, uh, like you've heard of tubal ligation, okay? So they tie up, that's what the ligation means, it means tie. So that's what DNA ligase is, they come and press and tie the Okazaki fragments together, but the enzyme DNA polymerase one is removed, it, it puts, it brings and puts the nucleotides next to the, right here. Okay, that's DNA polymerase. And then of course, 
the DNA ligase comes in and binds them together, the, uh, the Okazaki fragments. Okay, so here they are showing you DNA polymerase one, removing the primer, the RNA primers, and then of course, bringing the new strands, nucleotides next to the old template. But DNA ligates right here, they're putting these Okazaki fragments together. The three, they're showing you three of them, one, two, three Okazaki fragments, they're putting it together. Okay, I think uh, pretty much, oh, one minute. In principle, copying DNA, a process called DNA replication, is very simple. The two complementary DNA strands separate, and because each nucleotide can only pair with its complement, adenine with thymine and cytosine with guanine, each strand can be used as a template to build a new complementary strand, producing two DNA molecules. In the cell, DNA replication is a little more complicated, but the principle is the same. For clarity, we have untwisted the double helix. Remember that each DNA strand has a three prime and five prime end, and the strands run in opposite directions. DNA replication begins at specific sites called origins of replication. Proteins attach here and separate the DNA strands, forming oh. replication bubbles, which grow in both directions. Enzymes called DNA polymerases move along the template DNA strands and catalyze the elongation of new strands. Because DNA polymerases can only assemble new DNA in the five prime to three prime direction, only half of the new DNA can be synthesized in one continuous piece. The other half is synthesized in short pieces. As the replication bubbles grow, one daughter strand is synthesized continuously while the other daughter strand is synthesized in pieces. The pieces are joined together by the enzyme DNA ligase. Eventually, all the replication bubbles merge, yielding two identical DNA molecules. Yeah, very good. Thank you. And then here they are, DNA ligase. Okay. Another one. Here you can see the sun. Simultaneous formation of the leading and lagging strands. A DNA polymerase assembles a continuous leading strand while primates, other DNA polymerases, and ligase all work together to make the lagging strand. The enzyme helicase continues to untwist the double helix, exposing more template strand DNA for replication. Okay. Here is a table with the list of the enzyme and a little bit of diagram to tell you guys what's happening. Uh, bacteria are in replication proteins and their functions. Uh, that's pretty much the same as human uh, eukaryotic cells. Uh, the big difference was the number of the nucleotides per second, uh, a lot more in eukaryotic cells, a lot less. In in uh, uh, prokaryotic cells, about 550 something there. Okay, the last uh, uh, thing that DNA is so long, <clears throat> and then if the whole entire cell wants to unwind, you know, this is coiled up together pretty much, so you guys can see that. And then if the whole entire thing wants to unwind, the cell is not big enough. So what happens, they call it the trombone model. The DNA, it kind of, still replication is occurring, duplication of DNA is occurring. So what happens, the DNA is like a trombone the, 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 uh, instrument, the wind instrument, trombone is like this, and that the replication is occurring. Um, and there is a protein molecule that uh, he's uh, uh, mentioning it here. Um, is, he, is he mentioning the protein molecule, parental DNA, leading strands, DNA polymerase, parental DNA? No, he's not mentioning the uh, protein molecules. Uh, connecting, yeah, I guess he's mentioning connecting the proteins. So you have <coughs> this 
DNA template is on top of, it's occurring on top of that DNA template and it looks like a trombone and then they call it connecting uh, proteins. Every cell in your body is produced by cell division. Before each cell divides, it must copy its genetic material in a process called DNA replication. Understanding of DNA replication comes largely from studies of E. coli, bacteria that are found by the billions in your large intestine. Let's take a look at how DNA replication occurs in an E. coli cell. As we zoom in, we see the DNA. At the origin of replication, the two strands of DNA separate, serving as templates for making new strands. The result is a replication bubble. The bubble grows in both directions, forming two replication forks. Let's zoom in on one of them. Many proteins work together at the replication fork. Only some are shown. Here, the DNA is unwound and DNA polymerases, shown in orange, build new strands of DNA. Original parental DNA strands are shown in dark blue. Newly formed DNA strands are shown in light blue. Because strands in a DNA double helix run in opposite directions, the new strands must be made in different ways. One new strand, the leading strand, is built continuously. The other new strand, the lagging strand, is built in pieces. First, let's focus on the leading strand. DNA polymerase builds a new strand of DNA by adding DNA nucleotides one at a time. Each new nucleotide must pair up with its complementary nucleotide on the parental strand. Adding new nucleotides works the same way on both the leading and lagging strands. Each piece of the lagging strand begins with a short segment of RNA, shown in red. A clamp surrounds the RNA and attaches to DNA polymerase, which builds the rest of the new piece as DNA. When the piece is finished, it is released from DNA polymerase. How are pieces of the lagging strand joined together? A different DNA polymerase removes RNA and replaces it with DNA. However, it cannot finish connecting the pieces. An enzyme called DNA ligase joins the pieces together. Okay. The, the Okazaki strands. Growth of the leading and lagging strands <clears throat> continues on both sides of the replication bubble until there are two identical DNA molecules. Although bacteria are very different from humans, the process of DNA replication in bacteria is similar to what happens in your own cells. Okay. Proofreading, yeah, that is very important. Uh, uh, what happens if there is, I should mention it, uh, there is a A to T, G to C, and uh, C to G, and a T to A, something like that. So when DNA is duplicating, if there is a mistake, instead of A to T, there is an A to G, DNA polymerase goes back and check them, okay? So if it checks and see G, instead of removing the you know, G and putting a T in here, you guys follow what I'm talking about, removing the G here and 
putting T instead does not do that. It removes A and puts C's. Ah, this is C, put a C in here. So in the very first one, you would have a C, G, G, C, C, G, T, A. And this is not same as that one. So DNA polymerase goes back and fix the mismatches. Okay, that's what this says. DNA polymerase proofreads newly made DNA uh, replacing any incorrect ones. I gave you an example. Uh, in the mismatch repairs, the repair enzymes correct the errors in base pairing are told to the law of base pairing, A to, A to T and G to C. Okay, so DNA can be damaged by exposure to harmful uh, DNA or physical agents such as cigarette smoking, x-ray, it can undergo spontaneous changes, the new nucleotide excisions uh, repair, the nuclease cuts out the uh, and replaces damage stretch of DNA. Right here, they're showing you uh, if a DNA is damaged and DNA polymerase goes and uh, fix the uh, new ones. And of course, the uh, DNA ligase put them together. So evolutionary significance of uh, altered DNA nucleotides error uh, errors rates uh, rate after proofreading repairs is a low but not zero. Okay, that's mutation. Remember, I said if A T changes to G C, that's mutation. Sequences uh, changes may become uh, permanent and can be passed on to next generations. So, so those mutations can be passed on to next generation, and uh, these changes mutations are the source of genetic variations upon which uh, natural selections operate. I haven't talked about natural selection at the end of this uh, very last lecture. I'll talk about that. Limitations of DNA polymerase uh, create uh, uh, problems for the uh, linear DNA of eukaryotic chromosomes. The usual duplications machinery provides uh, new ways of pipeline, three primes. So anyhow, these are this is not a problem. Quickly, are these things, uh, most of which are circular DNA. Okay. I think uh, we talked about this shorter and we already talked about it. So, what happens anytime a cell divides the chromosomes? They have end, these ends called telomeres. The end of the chromosomes is called telomeres. So, every time that a chromosome divide, the length of chromosome become shorter. So the chromosomes in me are shorter than chromosomes in you because I'm older than you. Okay, I hope I'm making some sense. And then uh, it has been uh, proposed that shortening of the telomeres is connected to the aging and so on and so forth. The germ cells have the enzymes telomerase and the atom at the enzymes telomerase uh, catalyzed lengthening of the telomere in germ cells. When we are talking about germ cells, we're talking about uh, sperm and egg, okay? Here they are, they're showing you telomeres at the end of the chromosomes and then uh, so on and so forth. Uh, plasmid circular DNA, in, uh, so you have the protein molecules called histones right here and DNA wraps around them twice. Imagine, uh, I think I talked about this, this is a histone molecule. So DNA wraps around it twice, as you can see, and moves on to the next uh, histone. Okay, that's pretty much what makes up the DNA. Several levels of DNA packing make up the compact chromosome seen in the metaphase cell. Even when a cell is not dividing, some of the DNA is folded tightly. The degree of DNA packing makes certain genes available or unavailable for transcription. Chromosomes consist of loops of supercoils, which are made up of tight helical fibers. These fibers are composed of nucleosomes, 
which consists of DNA wrapped around protein molecules. In the fiber, the DNA is unavailable for transcription. Each nucleosome is a cluster of proteins called histones. Nucleosomes change shape and position to allow RNA polymerases to move along the DNA and read the genes. Chemical modification of DNA and histones may affect chromatin structure and access to specific genes. Okay, so so eochromatin, um, this is the heterochromatin, the high top, this DNA. Imagine this is DNA. So this is very tight. DNA is called heterochromatin. But if it is a little bit loosened like this, that is called eochromatin. So if it is loosened up like this, then protein synthesis can take place. DNA can multiply. But when they're tightened up like this, very tight, it's called heterochromatin. Okay, dense packing of heterochromatin makes it difficult for a cell to expose genetic information to codes, which is the we are talked about it in future uh, chapters. But DNA has to become loosened like this in order to be able to uh, make protein molecules based on DNA. And that's the end of the material for this chapter. Make sure you know these things and then if you have any questions.